And joining me as always are the Chris's, uh, that's Chris Smyrner and Chris Ryan. And we'll be talking to you today about battling burnout and, and to do so, uh, you know, I, I know this is a topic we've talked about in our previous webinars, but today we're going to do a deep dive and we've brought on a really, really special guest to talk about it. That's Kimberly Strafford. Uh, but before we do that, real quick, Chris and Chris, you want to give a quick intro and kind of frame what we're talking about today? Sure. So, um, hey, everybody, it's really nice to be back with you. And uh, we've pretty much come to just about the end of the semester for most people. I know I'm in the Northeast. Uh, I live in Vermont. I'm the director of instructional design here at Kaplan. Um, and my kids have two weeks left. So we're in the, the, the countdown. Uh, I know and we finish up pretty late compared to most of the country. So you are either uh, closing in on the finish line or you have finished. And I think it's something definitely worth celebrating. Mm -hmm. um, but we also know that everybody's really tired and this is not what anybody planned for at the beginning of the semester. So really excited to, to dig deep into this topic with Kimberly and, uh, and the rest of the gang here and, um, and just see what we can learn in the next hour about how to recenter ourselves and take some time and, and get ready to go at it again later in the year. I'm Chris Ryan. Good to see all of you who've been here before and welcome to those of you who don't. I work in product strategy and development. Uh, like Chris, who didn't mention this, uh, I used to teach high school science. Uh, so we, we both have a, a high school science teaching background and um, I'm excited to be here and, and can't wait to uh, hear from you, Kimberly, about uh, some of these issues that we've all been battling with in this unforeseen crisis. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And I'm, again, I'm Dennis Sim. And if we can throw up a quick poll just to see uh, what level you teach and um, plus one to everything you all just said. Uh, and honestly, I, I know we'll talk about this a little bit later, but like what's going to happen next year? You know, I'm looking ahead for my own kids who are uh, eight and five and trying to figure out what's the game plan looking ahead. And um, also, you know, I haven't taught high school in high school, but I have been teaching for Kaplan for uh, just about 14 years now. So it's definitely been an interesting journey. And, and right now, test prep is in the news in all kinds of ways. So um, definitely topics that we can talk about if they come up in chat. But uh, as we're filling out this poll, without further ado, Kimberly Stafford, <laughs> the Director of Curriculum and Educational Services at Worry Woos. Welcome. It's Thanks. awesome to have you here. It's awesome to be here. I'm, I'm really excited to get this dialogue going and, and share experiences and help uh, some folks and all of us, myself included, uh, through it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, what, I, are, what are some of your main goals for today, Kimberly? Like what are, what are some of the things you wanna hit upon and maybe we'll just dive into one. To yeah, one. absolutely. Um, I would say that my, my first goal is to extend the theory or the, of um, self-care and self-compassion which is um, a bigger, almost like a meteor word uh, for lack of a better description. Uh, the self-care has kind of taken on, um, can be like a trite or a negative connotation or you know uh, things like that. Where, but through my research of delving into and changing the, the dialogue to self-compassion, compassion is empathy and action. And I love that as a guiding force towards what I've been doing with some of my work. And originally it started out with, you know, going and dealing with social emotional issues for children, for students. And it wasn't until we started these workshops that we really needed, we realized that it, they're not going to create a, a culture unless the teachers buy into it for themselves and um, practice what they're going to preach. And um, we soon quickly started working really hard to support the teachers. So that's our goal. That, that's awesome. And maybe we can start digging into that. Can we talk yeah. a little bit about the negative connotation to start? And maybe we can hear from folks in the chat as well. Yeah. I, I hear you. I've heard, you know, who has time for self-care, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, is that, uh, yeah, so please, uh, maybe we can frame that a little bit more for sure. Yeah, I feel like for a while or more recently, the term self-care is almost um, an apology, you know, for bad behavior, for something that you're going to do or for, you know, um, a guilty pleasure or something like that. You know, when you think of those, those lines, those, that um, use of words, you know, guilty pleasure, self-care, indulging, you know, things like that, it can get for 
for caretakers and caregivers more specifically, I think we stay away from it because that goes against our nature. And I think all the, you know, for most of the folks here, we didn't get into this situation for the big bucks. And if you did, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to put you aside and <laughs> explain to you how this really works. Um, so it's in us as teachers and caregivers and, and, and people to put ourselves last. Um, and, and right now it's taken, I think, this opportunity to pull the lid off of that and see that it's not, you know, a dirty word uh, or a bad word. And, you know, I've seen a lot of memes out there with, you know, bottles of wine and, and, and um, locking yourself in a room and a, a she shed and all of that stuff. And I feel like it's almost there. It's, it can be there if it's just, you want to feel good coming out of something and recharged coming out of some element of self-care or compassion, not guilty for taking that time in the first place. Right. I'm seeing in the chat, uh, Jennifer wrote about, you know, it's also self-care can have this association with privilege. I yes. mean, I don't want to call out the celebrities who have <laughs> associated themselves with self-care, but I'm imagining the, the slices yeah. of cucumber on right. the eyes and that's not, me <laughs> that's probably not a whole lot of us and and maybe it, fine if so but like that's uh i don't like to think of myself as like needing that or something you know? right right so, so how do you help people over like get past right. that of course yeah well we were talking earlier about that um there's this great metaphor for lack of a better word um about putting on your own oxygen mask before you put it on for anyone else, before you assist anyone else. Yeah, we see that all the time when we're flying. Um, and we were joking about how, you know, that is essential. And it's not like we're saying, go put your mask on, go hit the mini bar, go to first class, hang out, go talk to the pilot, you know, do all that stuff and then come and help the person next to you. This is just the bare necessities. And I think if we change the, the language to a necessity, it might be, I mean, we drink, we were, we're all starting to bring the water bottles now and that's self-care, you know, we take, there you go, good guys, good on you. Um, and I think it leans itself to more mindfulness, which is another word that can kind of get um, a, a bad connotation to, but being in the moment and appreciating what the moment is and what the moment brings you. Um, and then that, can diffuse the worries that you have that are going to happen or the worries you have about what just happened. So that moment of taking a deep breath, sometimes it's just taking a, a deep breath before you enter that room or enter that Zoom meeting or enter um, a situation um, that you know that can bring some anxiety up and stuff like that. Um, but I think D, D escalating this need to make it such a um, privilege, I think is a great way of putting it. It's not a privilege, it's a necessity. Um, and we're all learning that for better or for worse quickly in this situation. Yeah, I, I think we've talked a lot about this being a triage situation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that online learning is, is planned for, it's designed for either asynchronous or hybrid or, um, you know, synchronous, online engagement and what happened this spring to all of us was an immediate pivot often over a weekend or five mm -hmm. days or oh we'll put spring break now so you get seven days aren't you lucky <laughs> um to re-engineer your complete curriculum and turn on a dime and um i see we have a lot of, of nursing faculty and oh, i nice. i spent 10 years working in it with nursing faculty here at kaplan um before i joined the learning science team and Man, I know that uh, that many of you still have um, duties at hospitals and in the middle of a pandemic, I just think, you know, it, it's not surprising to me that our, um, you know, our attendees today that there's a lot of people who are probably suffering from burnout on multiple axes, you know, where their, their, their jobs are <laughs> layered on top of each other. Um, and, and, and they're both giving out, right? They're, they're pouring out, pouring out into other people. And they're probably also parents, spouses, friends, you know, uh, partners, all those other roles that they play in life. And um, I know we've heard previously that boundary setting in this new dichotomy of, hey, there's no more boundaries. You're working from home 24 seven, um, uh, you know, and, or you're working from home for your one job and then you're going to the hospital, which is also a scary place right now. 
So like, how do you compartmentalize and deal with the extra outgo of all of these roles? And how do you compartmentalize so you're not just kind of tending to the teacher role, but that you're also tending to the, the self as teacher, self as nurse, self as mom, self as whatever you are, so that you can kind of get it all together. <laughs> yeah. I would say um, the biggest thing I've been hearing is, yeah, worlds collide. My worlds are colliding, you know. So I see it as an opportunity to bring more of yourself to more parts of your world, if that's, a, um, if that is, if you guys get that idea. Um, I think being able to, what I've learned is huge is some teachers or some people, professionals need to have that like visual work life you know, this is my workspace, this is my dance space, this is your dance space, you know, this is how it goes. And I've been talking with teachers of, of that sort to do the virtual background, you know, in their home office and shut it off when they're, when they're not um, engaged in work activity. Um, and also the commutes are gone. Nobody for better or for worse. I mean, we were all talking about how, how hard they are, but they're also, they also were a time to decompress and to, physically separate your worlds. So we've been talking about creating a new commute, you know, going outside and doing a couple of laps in your backyard or walk up and down your street if you're able, um, or just, you know, spend an extra five or 10 minutes to do some deep breathing before you go on to your next life, your next thing. Um, we try to practice that here at home and we've been somewhat successful. Um, myself, I think um, it's a little harder, but to have that moment where, or, you know, if you used to ride the train home, then sit outside and read a chapter of your book. It's not something that you have to sign on to. It's not a class that you have to take. It's not a 30 minute deep meditation. It's giving yourself a breather 10 minutes before you are upstairs and people are screaming at you for something else. Can I ask you, Kim, about how do you keep yourself, sorry to jump in, um, during those 10 minutes of the decompress, I can find my my mind going to, oh, this is how I failed on in this regard because, you know, the situation, but I'm blaming yeah. myself in the yeah. typical way that I solve for things like, like uh, what, the horse boxer in Animal Farm who just yeah. says, I will work harder, right? Yes. And, <laughs> and that's how I've traditionally handled things. And that uh -huh. doesn't work anymore no. No. Uh, to solve, like the gap has just gotten bigger. So I can find that you know, those, I almost am keep trying to keep myself busy. So I don't distraction, um, yeah. a, a distraction, but then I'm not getting that time. How do I, during those decompressed times, not ruminate, not, mm. you know, start into self blame cycles and those kinds of things. Right. Well, there's a couple of things. Number one, um, try not to blame yourself for, cause no one can do mindfulness wrong. Um, no one can do a meditation in incorrectly those thoughts are gonna pop up no matter what that negative self-talk is is it's a loud little bugger and it's in a lot of our heads um we talk about attaching those worries or those feelings of like oh, i can't believe i did that or i didn't do that right um imagine a blue sky and if you can imagine a blue sky and each of those instances on the clouds so the clouds are there you can't do anything about them you're not going to make it a cloudless sky but you acknowledge them and you let them pass. Say, I see you, not right now. I see you, not. And if you think of it as what to replace it with, you wanna replace it with the talk you would give your best friend or the talk that you would give your spouse or your partner or your sibling. Um, replacing the negative self-talk with some compassionate self-talk. Like we, it was a day, but I did it, you know, or that was a crazy meeting and I shouldn't have said that, but it is what it is and we're going to move forward and you didn't, you know, everyone thinks they screw up a lot more than they do and we are all in this together. I know that sounds cheesy, um, but we're all coming at this from this place of, of fear and unknown. Um, but yeah, for, for definite exercise to practice is giving yourself that moment attaching the worry or attaching the negative self-talk onto something that you acknowledge and you let pass. So that's where I got the, we got the cloud idea. 
Got it. You kind of let it go fast. Kimberly, I I knew you'd be awesome, but (laughs) in this past 15 minutes, you've pretty much summed up a lot of the themes we've been talking about the past uh, few webinars. So thank you. Good, Um, good. I'm glad. I've always heard of it as don't try to avoid or push away those negative thoughts or blaming, but rather just be aware that it exists. Exactly. Because I find when I try to block it, it actually makes them only stronger and and that makes Mm -hmm. it a struggle. But again, I like the way you put it, actually, the blue sky and the cloud and knowing that the clouds are there and, and that's okay, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That, that's part of the world that you're in. And mm-hmm. in fact, they can make the world better. Yeah. Um, so um, to that end, I just want to make a point in the chat earlier, people are loving your analogies. People oh, talked about, okay, <laughs> um, they love the air flight analogies in particular. I know you have another one up your sleeve, so I'm gonna maybe ask you to share that one in a little bit. Um, oh, but yeah, they talked about not being able to pour from an empty vessel Yes. right um mm-hmm. you know or serving from an empty vessel or empty yep. container whatever it is whatever is empty these days right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just to sum up you know we've heard so far taking deep breaths little things like that That's creating huge. physical activity boundaries right mm-hmm. not just even physical space but also like actually using an activity to help you compartmentalize separate mm-hmm. it out and yeah. um and then when you're taking that time that would have been your commute that would have been your self-reflection time using that for mindfulness, using yeah. that not to blame yourself, but to say, hey, I'm aware that these negative things are happening. Right. But and that can make a world of a difference. But anyway, I just wanted to quickly sum no, up before great. we keep moving forward. Yeah. And I, I love how you touched upon um, the cart compartmentalizing, because that's another thing it, that kind of can get a negative um, twist on like, oh, I can't deal with this, I'm gonna do it. But we almost need that now. You know, and it's, I think it's important not to cheat on your compartmentalization. <laughs> so if your home time is your home time, you know, I'm going to have dinner with my family or I'm going to have lunch with my family or whatever, that, that is your time. So to be present in that moment and it's, it's hard, it, it requires some sort of discipline, but you would tell anyone else to go take that time. So yeah. you have to do it for yourself even if it's giving yourself another voice name, like, you know, all right, Priscilla's telling me, I got to, I got to sit down, you know, whatever, whatever you're going to give that person looking out after you, you can give them a name Um, and not to quote unquote cheat on it. So if you're having, if you're doing dinner with the family, your phone's not on the table, you know, um, physically put it in another room. Remember those days when like there was one phone in like another room and in the house and like, it rang and people were surprised and like, hello, it was almost like a question because you didn't know who it was and it was all exciting. We could do that again. We could, we could kind of put them in the other room. <laughs> I, we I we try to do that. We try to put the phones in like a bucket and put oh, them inside, you know, yep. and, and yeah. sometimes we play a game like the first one that rings gets Ooh, like a, you know. That's good. That's good. Um, but uh, I, I, that actually was really timely. Uh, someone actually asked, uh, Amanda asked, how do you protect yourself when others disrespect the few moments you do take for self-care? And, and it sounds like you've given the answer. I don't know if you have anything else to give Amanda advice here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would say you have to be true to your, yourself. And if, if someone is infringing on that, I mean, there, it depends depends on what the infringement is. Is it your kid with a nosebleed or is it, you know, um, a boss who, you know, is emailing you at seven o'clock at night? Um, It's, I, I, what I've found is that more often than not, when you set a clear and kind boundary, people not only respond, but then it kind of spreads like, oh, that's a great, you should do that. You know, I should do that. You know, it's, it, it kind of gets contagious in a good way, you know? Um, but the key is, is kind, kind, firm boundaries, um, you know, and watching the language you use to, to protect that time. Say, this is really my time to recharge for my next thing. You know, we, we give, we, as a society, we give each other, you know, as much space as we can in life. And you know, it, people need to sign off or do something or step away from something. We respect that. That's just who we are. They're going to respect you. It's just you not giving yourself the permission to ask for it. That can be the, the bunch in the situation. 
Yeah, I know. It, it's funny that you say that because um, I have uh, colleagues who figured out the feature on Google Calendar where you can set your working hours. Oh. And I see all of these these chats with um, you know students uh, texting at all hours of the night and faculty requesting meetings at seven thirty at night and like all of this stuff. And um, I, I know I'm guilty. I work after I put my kids to bed. Sometimes I you know because I try to squeeze it in right because you get that guilt. You know, okay, so we went for a walk at three in the afternoon, which means I need to make up that hour and I'm going to do it yeah. at nine o'clock at night. And like it, it bleeds in. And, and sometimes you think that's great because the nooks and crannies are like where you can do this work from home thing, which feels mm -hmm. so empowering until it feels yes. overwhelming. Yes. And so when I get that back from a colleague, when I try to schedule a meeting, it's like, how is this outside his normal working hours? Like it's, <laughs> it's only 430. Oh, they start at eight. Yeah. But it always makes me question like, what are my working hours and what would be the boundary that I would feel comfortable establishing? And I, when you said it was really convicting, I'm like, I need to take that time and block it out so yeah. that even if I'm working, it's my choice. It's not somebody else trying to summon me to a meeting at right. some weird hour. Right. Right. And like I said, it doesn't have to be, you know, an hour, three hours, you know, it could be in little 15 minute chunks. Um, I think of if there are parents out there that um, ever watch a, a preschooler eat an apple, right? They don't eat the whole thing right away. They put it down, they take a bite, they come back, they take a bite, they do, you know, or with anything. It's um, those little pieces when you can. Now, I'm not saying that it needs to be another ball to juggle because we got to start dropping some of these. <laughs> There's too much to juggle at some point, but it could be, um, you know, in between the two o'clock and three o'clock hour taking 15 minutes. And, you know, the world is not going to end if you are three minutes late for a meeting or, you know, it's, it's, um, it may seem like it. it, it seems like it to you because you are, you know, you only know you um, and what you only know your feelings. You can recognize your feelings in other people but for you, for the most part, you know that it's causing you so much stress. Like the, imagine walking in late to a class or a meeting like that feeling, like just thinking about it makes me anxious. <laughs> so it, it's more on, on you than how you're being perceived. I, I, I love that line, Chris, of working from home can feel empowering until it's until overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Yeah. I, I think that's huge. For me, it's a couple points I'll make here is for me, that line is usually when when I think about why I'm doing that extra work, right? Mm -hmm. If it's for guilt, like self-guilt, or because you feel like you could be doing more, I think mm -hmm. that becomes really dangerous. And I think mm -hmm. that that then blurs the lines to the point where the overwhelming aspect starts. Um, mm -hmm. And so I actually, I also think it actually sets um, a bad precedent for the others who are you're interacting with in a professional manner. So. Um, not only I love the advice that's going on in the chat around like uh, email schedule, email hours. I also, if I do feel like I need to send something out, I will actually schedule when I will send it out. So I make it go out in the morning so that I'm not setting, like a lot of times people just emulate your behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are sending stuff out late, they'll think, oh, that's, that's when they're working. So let me mm -hmm. send stuff out too. And so I, I think it's, um, you know, I, I, and this is, yeah, Kimberly, this is great. Uh, just real quick, a couple mm -hmm. other things I want to recap for folks who may have just joined. So far, we've talked about how compassion is empathy plus action, how self-care, it, it's not selfish. It has to be reframed as a necessity, right? I, I think that's something we're defining right now, the ways we can do that. And it doesn't mean you have to do it in a way that's been presented in, in media or popular culture, it doesn't mean it's the cucumbers, as Chris Ryan said, on your eyes. <laughs> Although I love those cucumbers, Chris Ryan. You don't know what you're missing. You got to try one day. I'm telling you, it's a very simple uh, one to, to put in action. But, um, but it's more of an opportunity to bring more of yourself to more parts of your world. So, and, and when those worlds collide, find an alternative commute. We talked about um, you know, finding a way to differentiate. If, it's, if it can't be a physical space, then think about how the activities can help you differentiate between the different responsibilities you have as an individual. And then, um, you know, we talked about being aware of negative self-talk and acknowledging it and then letting it pass like a cloud through a blue sky. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, so on that note, um, just we've kind of covered setting clear and kind boundaries for what you need. A common theme that's coming up in the chat that I would like to take a moment to pivot to is the idea of time, 
right? And, and how there just feels like there's less of it when we're at home. Um, Chris Ryan, actually, you could probably frame this well. You've always preached this like one out of five things can't happen online, right? That's been kind of, go ahead. I mean, I'd love yeah, to Yeah, um, well, one thing I was gonna say that uh, um, on, on a similar point is what Lynn put in the chat up above that I think is also another, has to be another tool in our arsenal of dealing with the overwhelm, which is around, I think, the institutions that we're part of and the, the working groups are part of, sometimes everybody's trying to do the same thing they were doing mm -hmm. and then scheduling the 7 p.m. meeting and so forth. So in the same way that we're taking care and being compassionate towards ourselves and setting the boundaries, I think we do have to help our, when that is happening too much um, and just saying, no, nope, I'm not gonna do it, but then it still happens. What are the ways we communicate with each other um, in such a way to, to help some of our bosses, some of our mm -hmm. colleagues to reframe what they really need, because in a sense, all bets are off. So if I can come back to the one in five thing, but uh, Kimberly, I'd love to hear what you think about, like, what are ways that we can help each other be more compassionate towards each other as well? Absolutely. Well, I do think that it's through practice. It's through engagement. It's through... Um, doing the, the walk, you know, <laughs> instead of just talking about it, um, you know, being, supporting the person, you know, if someone writes an email saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking the next 15 minutes for a meditation or my working hours are not doing this, sending a little good for you, you know, keep it going, let me know, like, I applaud you or, you know, thumbs up to that. Um, I think also keeping keeping it that we are, even though we're all in our little physical bubbles, you know, um, we are still a community and whatever community that could be for you, for a work community, a school community, um, a neighborhood community, whatever of those things. But it's just important to know that it can spread in a good way if you are willing to do it. And so what are we afraid of? We're afraid of, I've been hearing a lot of like, the word guilt coming up. Um, we, we're probably afraid of people taking advantage or people, or we being perceived as taking advantage of the situation that we're home. So, you know, we, we work less. Some of us are worried that we have to prove that we are um, valuable and not even valuable, but essential to our company or to our school or to, so we have all those things working against us. So if we can flip the script on that and really just support the people that are taking the strides to make sure that, you know, they're giving their all without giving it all. And I'll, I'll share it just recently. I've been working on something for other people to teach. Uh -huh. And I was pouring a lot of myself into notes mm -hmm. and the feedback, the really candid feedback I got from someone was actually that's not great because it seems like a script. Why don't you just give a couple bullets? And it turned out, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh yeah. And it was, it was one, it was taking me more time and it was really uh -huh. driven by guilt and like, oh, yeah. and I have to over deliver on this and so forth. And then it turns out when I finally got the feedback, which I think I was a little afraid of mm -hmm. um, beforehand, it was like, well, it was candid. Like, actually you don't need all that. Right. And that was kind of awakening. And it makes me feel like sometimes maybe if we're just sort of there's the term radically candid, which is okay. not just about being candid, but also about being doing it from a place of kindness. Oh, nice. Um, we need to we need to strike that balance with each yeah, other. Absolutely. Absolutely. How are we doing this? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, go ahead, go ahead, Chris. I know there was a comment you saw that you wanted to jump in on. Uh, Chris Murner, Dennis. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Um... You know, this, the, I, I saw it flip by uh, a little while ago, but from one of our nursing faculty who said, you know, teaching at home is more stressful than working in the ER during a pandemic, which mm -hmm. is a stunning statement. Um, but I think it really speaks to the degree of which when your sort of sanctuary, which I saw somebody else, you know, say home doesn't feel like a sanctuary, yeah. it doesn't feel like a safe space like it did before. You know, and, and I think the commute idea of like going outside and like coming back in as your office or like, you know, taking your time walking downstairs to your office, which is what I often do. Like I, I try to leave my laptop in my office. I try to make sure that 
this is the only place I'm doing that. Unfortunately, it's also my primary laptop. So occasionally it has to come out and play, but, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, I think it, it really speaks to the disruption that happens when there's not physical separation and also your, your rules of engagement have changed, right? I think that's what it feels like to me in the chat. It's like the rules aren't the same. Like now I have to figure out how to send an email tomorrow morning. So students don't think I'm actually checking this at midnight when you actually are and you shouldn't be right and and you don't know what to do but you're trying to be better and trying to set that expectation that the student won't hear from you until then and it looks like it's kind of a cascade you know mm -hmm. to me where, where you come home you think it's going to be better or, or you think it's at least going to be something you can roll with and now we have all these downstream consequences of i don't feel like my house is my house i feel like i'm on all the time i feel like i just want to go to work where it's normal and it's like it mm -hmm. used to be even in, in the middle of a crisis yeah. So it, it it feels like it's escalating and it's not a surprise to me, like I said, that we have so many people attending today that are just like, oh no, like we survived. Please don't make me do this again this fall. So how do we kind of step away for a minute, try to reestablish home as home, try to think about if we have to do this in the fall, in a, even in a different capacity where it's not full time, it's still like a backup plan. How do we prepare for that mentally so we're not freaked out about the way that we feel now and thinking it's going to be a persistent state. I'd yeah. love to hear you talk about that because I feel like that's what I'm getting from all these yeah. awesome colleagues. I feel like if there's a way to work from the outside in instead of the inside out. So if you, that makes perfect sense to me that that person feels more calm and in control in the ER because that's where he or she, that's where you're an expert. Like there's, you know, I, I, I see nurses in action quite a bit and they, they know where everything is. They know what's going on. They know what's happening next. They know what time they're having lunch. They know what they ordered for lunch. They know everything, but putting that and then having to go teach a class on new equipment that you haven't necessarily been briefed on until last minute, it's all to use the medical term. It's all triage, <laughs> you know, it's all just putting out little fires. So if we're going to now gained the knowledge that we have of what is expected of us, gained the knowledge of, the ha of what we need for ourselves, create that physical space for you, I think is so important. Even if it, and, and take a moment to have a little bit of pride in it, you know, okay, what is, what, all right, I'm going to be stuck. If it's at the edge, edge of your dining room table, then, you know, use your favorite mug or, um, you know, put a, put a, um, a blanket, you know, behind you. I know it's, we're coming into the summer months, but maybe a blanket that your grandmother made you that makes you smile or surround yourself in this little kind of comfort zone, create your own comfort zone. So that way you'll, you should hopefully still get that feeling of, of accomplishment and love. And, you know, you know what, I do know what I'm talking about and I can, you know, I'm going to hit the wrong button, but it's going to work out. So I think, like I said, the beginning is just to take the outside and control what you can control. And that is this little square, you know, and make it, make it your own. Um, after that, then we work, you know, we're, you're saying uh, the cascading that you were talking about. I think um, for a lot of us, we're just, I think of it as juggling plates or spinning plates. And sometimes you have to let a plate fall. You just gotta let it fall. So pick your plate, you know? what's the worst that's going to happen sometimes uh what we do is we'll take a fear or a worry and we'll divide it up into three sections um do you accept this worry do you ch you want to change this worry or do you want to reject this worry so accept change or reject so if the worry is there i don't want to send that email at midnight Okay, so we can either accept it, like, you know what, it is what it is. If they see the timestamp, they see the timestamp. That's what I've got, you know, I'm going to forget it in the morning and I can go to sleep now knowing I sent it. Then that needs to be changed, um, needs to be accepted. Change it, you change it. You don't, you don't send it um, at, the, at the time. You, like you said, schedule a specific time, like um, Dennis mentioned, when he's going to send that email and give yourself a reminder. Um, rejecting it is more, uh, it's along the same, sometimes it's the same as accepting it. <laughs> it's like, you know, accepting what it is or rejecting the negative connotation it implies if you send that email too late. 
you know, um, and then visualizing what, what the worst that could happen. What's the worst that could happen? You get an email back at 1230, you know, from, <laughs> from one of your students. And then you say, well, what are you doing up so late? You know, now, you know, or, um, then you might have to refocus on some boundaries after that. If you want to move forward, say, look, I know I sent that, uh, after hours, but we're for all of us, I really think for the sake of all of us, let's, adhere to the time frame that we're going to uh, uh, try to adhere to and I'm going to hold myself accountable. But I think I think some plates need to be dropped. <laughs> so I, and I'm not trying to, to steal away Dennis's no. MC, but in watching this this kind of unfold in the right. Um, <laughs> so for fall, if we're going to talk about spinning plates, things to fall in anticipation of worries. Um, I see one educator already weighed in that they're didactic, so their, their classroom learning um, is going to be fully online again, and they already missed the interactions that they're not going to have. And um, I think that's, a, a, you know, people are still playing catch up for this semester, right, and learning a new educational tool on the fly and trying to train other people if they're in that role. And it's so crazy still. And what they would normally be doing now is, oh, well, what should we do differently for fall? And having like kind of right. what seems like <laughs> nice tie up meetings, which can't even happen <laughs> yet, right? So we know that like the statistics are kind of ominous. Like whenever you watch these attention grabbing headlines, it's sort of uh, Prado's principle of like 80 20, right? It, yesterday we saw that, you know, one in five educators are thinking of not coming back to the classroom because this was so miserable um, and so stressful. And I saw in the Globe yesterday that one in five students in Boston Public School are for all practical purposes have dropped out because they're yeah. just off the radar. We haven't engaged with them since we left the classroom. And those both struck me in the heart, like we're losing kids that we need to interact with and we're losing amazing faculty who just didn't have the support or right. it was just too much. So now knowing, like you read those headlines, they freak you out and then you sit with it for a little while and you're like, but what can we do now to make ourselves more resilient over the next couple of months so that we're successful in doing something we love in the fall and that we can reach the kids that need to be reached and get them to trust us that come back it'll it'll you know it'll, it'll be, be better okay. yeah yeah i think there's something to finding new ways to connect and i don't know how realistic this is mm -hmm. but if something as simple as if the teachers get the role sheet ahead of time. I don't know if they'll get class lists or anything. Um, reaching out, like mailing a letter during the summer or um, setting up a, a chat or giving, setting up um, an office hour chat almost. I know Dennis was talking um, briefly before we started that he, you, well, I don't mean to speak for you, but I'm gonna, um, you were saying that you were missing that connection with your students. You know, you want to say, hi, how are you? This is crazy, but let's go do this math that I didn't even understand when you said it. So um, I'm not a math person, um, but so maybe, and I know that it sounds like one more thing, you know, like we're asking teachers we are asking teachers to do so much now. And I, I don't want to be the person to put one more hour or one more thing. But if you could hold a hangout, you know, Thursdays, 11 o'clock to 1130, just come and see me and we'll talk. We'll see how you're doing. You know, we'll see how everyone's feeling. Um, it, it means a lot that the teachers are showing up. I think they also need to know that. They need to know that the fact that we can see their faces and see that they are putting in the time and the effort, it means so very much to all of us. So they need to feel that. Um, but I do think that the connection that is lost, it's not gonna be replaced. It can't be replaced, but it can be reinvented. So through the visual, through keeping your camera on, through having a Zoom hour, if you could, or a Zoom office hour, if you have connect ways to connect with them before the class starts, you know, before the fall starts, sending them a little note or sending them a letter. I know that sounds like, you know, I've got a million students and a million other things to do, but it could be, you know, it would be a guarantee that you're not opening yourself up into an empty void of Zoom and not recognize any faces or, you know, feel mm -hmm. like you're making a difference. I'm really connecting with what you said of find new ways to connect um, and feeling and, and this idea of it's going to be different. We just have to reinvent it. Mm -hmm. um, and 
that is, I, I'd love to see in the chat and I'm seeing how, mm -hmm. how people are, are, are chatting in around this mm -hmm. issue. Um, and it, it can feel like more, but I mean, the Dennis and Chris and I spend so much time, we, we work in test prep. That's, mm -hmm. you know, Kaplan is known for that. That's right. part of what we do. Mm -hmm. But we also know that, you know, if you're worrying about the MCAT, the NCLEX, the name, the SAT, the anything, the whole self is there before that. And mm -hmm. if there's like the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. you got to deal with that first before you can get to the, it was quadratic equations. <clears throat> We won't, we won't cover that. That will not be on the test. Um, it's all right. So, but if, but if the person is, is worried about something else, then you often have to deal with that separately and first, right. and then you can deal with the other right. things. So how do we find new ways to connect here is I think right. a really powerful idea. Yeah, I think it's very powerful. And we also run into you know, for those of um, those folks out of the, that are teaching at a high school level or, or um, a middle school level, or, you know, you're also a mandated reporter. So if there is stuff that comes up that you're in a Zoom office hour and you see something or a child says something, then you're automatically like, okay, how do I, you know, so that can bring up a whole nother can of worms too. So um, to be able to already establish some sort of trust um, would be super, super beneficial or already some sort of um, community, you know, culture, community culture together. That's, that's awesome. And, and Chris Smirner, you can have my job anytime. Uh, <laughs> I, knew, I knew my job would be easy coming into this one. Uh, it's been just amazing to hear just all of you talk about different ways we can support each other. So we're about two thirds of the way through. Here's our 40 minute recap. Um, you know, thank you as always to Katie for putting these together, but be kind and candid, support one another. We're all going through this. This is something we've talked about this entire time. Um, when home doesn't feel like a sanctuary, uh, use something special. It can be a, a blanket, a mug, a photo that makes it your own, kind of the same way you might decorate your office space. Uh, and then I love the pick your plate, Kimberly. <laughs> Um, actually, there was a comment that came in from Tina Marie that was that got people really chiming in. It was for nurses, we're always on high alert. No mm -hmm. plates can fall, or we or we risk the life or their safety. Uh, and that nurse educators always think like that as well. Mm -hmm. And so she said, one of her colleagues always says, "No one is coding in the classroom, so let's take our time to shelf the plate." Right. So, and and I think that that is you know that really makes a lot of sense. And um, you know, how can we be more resilient? Let's find new ways to connect with students. Zoom office hours. Uh, when we brought on Chris uh, from NYT a little while back, we talked about sending a physical note or, or recording a small message. And I talk, I've talked about it this a couple of times. I, you know, my eight-year-old son, uh, he watches the same video that his second grade teacher sent them over and over again, anytime he's feeling discouraged. And it's just mm -hmm. this, it's this simple short message of her just saying, I miss you, keep at it. We'll see each other again soon. And that just helps him feel connected to everything that's going on. And it's the small things that I think help us stay connected. Absolutely. Um, and then, okay, last thing, with 17 minutes to go, I, make, I have a proposal. Um, we've had some private chats come in and I think it's a great idea. I'd love to reserve the last 10 minutes, uh, Kimberly, to talk, uh, maybe even go through a mindfulness exercise with you, a self-reflection exercise, if you're game for that. Because mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot, and please tell us in the chat if you agree, like I think there are a lot who would love to just model that and see if there's things that they could do in there commute time to, yes. to better themselves. And then um, up until that time, we'd love to, of course, keep hearing from you. Specifically, I'd love to talk about what Chris Myrna was kind of alluding to, which is like, well, what's the game plan now? Like, yes, we'll spend the last 10 minutes reflecting, but now Chris, I see you're about to jump in. What is the game plan for the summer if we aren't going back in the fall? And, and I know Chris, we have some plans to kind of cover that as well. Yep. Yeah, and I'm excited about it. I mean, I think, um, you know, everybody did the best they could. And, uh, and we've talked, we've, we've talked a lot about grace, right? Like we did the best we could with the tools we had and sometimes tools we didn't even have until they were just dumped in our lap via an email. Right. Um, <laughs> so we learned them, we figured them out. We, we kind of, you know, got the boat to shore, so to speak for the term. So we've talked about how online learning is usually engineered and planned for ahead of time. Um, and that's fantastic. Nobody had any time to do that this time, but in the event, uh, which seems more obvious than not, that things aren't going to be, you know, business as usual come fall, 
um, you know, what do we do to make it better next time? So we feel like we're more in control of the situation and we can um, take a little more ownership of, uh, of the situation, but also look back at what we did really well so that we replicate it and don't forget about it. So we're gonna start um, next month, so the month of June, which is like almost here. And uh, we're gonna do a, a free series in this webinar, uh, same, same people, same bat channel, so to speak, and, um, and go through instructional design for online learning, like how, how to do it. And we're gonna do it together. Like you guys all have different tools, you'll have different uh, populations that you're teaching, different learners you're working with, but we wanna be sure that we're here for you. We know different districts, different schools have, have people too. Please use them. Um, they know your tools better than we do, but at least best practices and some of the evidence-based things that we know that we'd love to share with you so that you feel better going into the classroom this fall, we wanna help with that. And so um, look for more information. We have a blog that we'll send out with this video after we're done um, by the end of the week, ideally, or first of next week, I guess. Um, and we'll have more details for you then. We don't know exactly the date that we're starting, but um, suffice it to say, they'll be recorded, they'll be available for you, but we wanna be a resource and we wanna help you guys out. So we're looking forward to that. It's, it's, it's good nerd fun for us, if nothing else. Yeah, yeah. and Chris Ryan, I know you have some thoughts here that maybe you can share. Our place in this as a test prep company, I, I think is something we've embraced. And I think there's yeah. value to be added here. So please. Um. Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, you, you associate Kaplan with test prep that uh, Stanley back in the day pioneered this whole, this whole endeavor. Um, test prep is an interesting little area of education because uh, we deal with these kinds of demons a lot. These tests are high stakes. And so we, when we get students, we're seeing them when they are confronting not only the content of the test, and, but what it means beyond it. And so we, we got some experience that didn't get us ready for this pandemic, of course, but sort of what is, you know, whether it's growth mindset or other aspects of social and emotional learning, um, I feel like we've had a particular window into, well, what are students like when, you know, they're facing uh, the, the, the GMAT, the GRE, you name the test. Um, and so that's given us a bit of a lens into some of these issues. And that's why, that's one of the reasons we wanted to share them with you. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so Kimberly, we're all yours. If all you right. want to take us through this, and then and then we will help folks who are planning for fall in June. <laughs> Where right now, let's focus on how far we've come. All right. Um, so yes, I want first of all, um, we had talked a little bit about uh, creating uh, an I did list instead of an I do list, and I just wanted to to give. Um, a little shout out to that. That could be something that you're done that you've done um, as part of the um, commute coming back and being a part of um, the transition. You know, okay, I'm pat myself on the back because I did you know X, Y, and Z, and I can keep moving forward. I can go on to the next thing. But uh, this is also something that you can do either um, on your own or before bed or before the morning or whatever. So what I'd like you to do is if everyone is sitting comfortably, um, if you want to you want to feel supported, so you want to feel like you can sink into your chair wherever you are. And if you are tall enough, <laughs> your feet will hit the floor. If not, then you're like me. And um, you're trying to just ground yourself in this space. And if you can put your hands on, um, on the chair or on your thighs or something like that. So the first thing I wanna talk about is being able to breathe. I know that sounds ridiculous. You all have been you know, complete exer experts in breathing uh, so far, well done. Um, but what we do as, uh, as humans, we, we tend to shut off our breathing right here. We take short little protected breaths um, instead of deep, what we call belly breaths at the, at the Worry Woos. Um, taking that deep breath in um, gives you that settling time and it gives you, it slows down your initial knee jerk reaction time to things as well. So we're gonna take a nice deep breath and I want you to imagine as if you're going all the way down into your belly to fill up that belly with air and opposed to lifting 
your chest up. So your chest really shouldn't rise. Um, you can even put your hand on your belly, and I know that's a vulnerable thing for some people, but you can take a time to put um, just your hand right on your belly to remind that belly to kind of fill up with air. So if we could try that and just breathe through your nose and then out through your mouth. And if you can take a moment to sigh, like someone just told you something so ridiculously boring or what have you that you just can't deal anymore. So you take a nice big belly breath <sighs> and you just sigh it out. Now, um, as you're taking these belly breaths, I want you to imagine that there is some warm energy kind of starting from your toes and you can give it a color, you can give it um, sparkles, you can give it whatever it is, but in your mind's eye, you're imagining this rejuvenating kind of energy starting from the tips of your toes and then filling in all the gaps of your bones and ligaments and tendons and all that good stuff. And it's just gonna rise up to your knees and it's gonna keep going to your chest, to your arms, your belly, your back, and your head. And notice if you have stopped breathing. That's something that as humans we do, it's also about self-preservation, you know, way back when where you're running from the woolly mammoth, you know, you only could take short breaths and you had to run really fast. We don't have to do that anymore, but our body is still programmed to see stress as that sort of threat and our body responds in kind. So to remind yourself that there is no woolly mammoth chasing you, <laughs> basically, is a way to kind of kick it back to the real world. So a nice big belly breath, breathe it out. Now, as you take this next breath in, I would love for you to think of a thought, a hope, or a wish that you have for yourself. It could be anything. You're not telling this to me. You are just breathing out that intention out into the universe, for lack of a better word. So you breathe in and then breathe out that thought, hope, or wish for yourself. And then you're gonna turn back to your natural breathing. What I'd love for you to do the next time is you're gonna take an inhalation again, filling that belly breath up with air and then blowing out a thought, a hope or a wish for someone else. It could be anybody else. You're just sending it out to them. And let your belly get back to normal. And then we're gonna take another deep belly breath in and a thought, a hope or a wish for the world, for all of us. And give yourself a minute to let your breath get back to its regular pace. You might wanna move around your fingers and your toes a little bit and it's just Finding that moment to be present, to be accountable of all good, bad, in between. And you're prepared to move on to the next thing. And I think a great way to prepare is to state one thing you are grateful for before moving on to the upstairs for dinner or the next meeting or any of that. So practicing a little bit of, of gratitude and saying it out loud. You know, I'm grateful for electricity. <laughs> I am grateful for seltzer. You know, any of those things that help you be who you are and, and that you're grateful for. And then that's pretty much it for as far as the basic kind of meditation, mindfulness activity. Um, it can be done anywhere, anytime. It can be, you can also have that beautiful image of your breath being a wave starting and going out 
if you really can't put any words to, you know, mind and you don't want to do that um, hope, prayer, thought, you can just envision waves in and out along with your breath. And that will give you the moment that you deserve before you move on to the next thing and the next way you're going to help someone else. And what's the, what's the science behind it? Cause I, I'll be honest, Kimberly, for mm -hmm. a long time, um, either in hubris or just <laughs> ignorance, really, I resisted. I'm like, I don't need that. Yeah, you know, yeah. like who needs that? Right. Yeah, and it's yeah. not until this, all this happened where I actually realized the, like, it just, it made, it made me feel like, I could do the next thing that I needed to, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Versus being overwhelmed by this mountain of tasks. So wh why, why does that help? What is, what is the point of mindfulness? That's a very good question. Uh, well, I'm not a scientist um, or a psychologist actually um, either, but what I've gathered in my research and my experience is that at the very basic, the breathing technique I actually learned as an actor was to be able to project and to be heard and the point that so many of us breathe so shallow, you know, that we only breathe to about here. And if you say, take a deep breath, you notice everybody's chests go up. <laughs> um, and so you're not getting all the oxygen. You, you, when you start to deep belly breathe, you at the very basic, get more oxygen to your brain. So you might actually feel a little lightheaded at the beginning. Um, and you might wanna, you know, stare at your finger or, um, focus on something that doesn't move because you're getting so much more oxygen to your brain. So that's a natural kind of like, I'm awake, you know, I'm, so you have that feeling of, I can do this, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm sleepy and now it's cuddle time or anything like that, but you're, you're charged. Um, so that's the number one, the, just taking the time to take some deep breaths is the basic and it is the most important in my opinion. Um, then we can move on to, you know, there are pressure points in your body that can help in certain ways. Um, the blowing out through your lips, like, <laughs> again, sounds like a crazy, um, you know, warm up from theater camp, but it is something that will set um, the good, good feeling vibe hormones, I'm very technical in my speech, um, in the brain to get buzzing. You know, um, something like this does the parasympathetic um, and little neurons in your, in your body that can help. That's a good word. I like that word. Um, so it's anything that, that can relax and fuel you at the same time. But relax is the wrong word. I think it means you're, it makes you available to mm. it. You know, so the deep breaths, the, the good oxygen, the, the setting the time. So these are all pluses in your favor. They're making you available. So it's not like you're going to, I'm not giving you a superpower to go slay the next thing, but you're kind of becoming your own superhero. Sounds like it's the opposite of fight or flight yeah. or freeze or any of those things, which I always thought it was weird that that's the sympathetic nervous system right like mm -hmm. that should be the nice one right, right but it's right. not it's the <laughs> one that like freezes you up and makes you feel flooded and yeah yeah and you think about it it's in us you know to protect ourselves that's in our innate from you know day we crawled up <laughs> so you know we've been trying to protect ourselves and we do have reasons to protect ourselves you know with the kids we call them safety worries you know, you don't go up to a dog you don't know, you don't cross the street without looking both ways. Those are, are worries and, and um, things that keep us safe. But a lot of it, um, because we have no direct, until now we have a pandemic, so thank you. Um, but, you know, there was no direct threat to us that sometimes we create them for ourselves. Mm. And, um, mm. and this is a, a good way to, to fact check yourself in what is reality and what is really happening. We see that a lot in test takers too, right? Yeah. This, the need to breathe. Uh, I mm. think there've been studies done where poor breathing actually correlates with poor test taking. So oh, wow. yeah, I'm sure there are me. lots of connections there. Yeah. Uh, but that is the end of our time that we have today. It is uh, 3.59 Eastern. Thank you all again for joining us. Uh, look forward to seeing you again in June. Kimberly, we're gonna have to have you back. You were I would love to. This is so super fun. amazing. And maybe we can do it after all the planning has happened oh, so that yeah. we can talk even further about kind of the journey that folks have been through. Yeah. Thank you all for joining. This is Dennis and the Chris's signing off once again. We will <laughs> see you again next time and look forward to hearing from you and hearing your thoughts as you 
proceed and close out the year in the right way. See y'all soon.